Oh. Well, around the year 1900, one of the old brethren, D.L. Miller, decided he was going to break all the rules uh, and head off on a world tour. Brethren were still reeling from a three-way split that was uh, uh, based upon what is purity? Could we have Sunday schools? Did we want ministers to be trained? Um, and a lot of other little things that don't matter to us today. Could you have Sunday school picnics? That was a big issue in the 1880s. Uh, what was allowed and what wasn't. And in the midst of this, D.L. Miller, one of the old brethren with a big long beard wearing a black coat and a white shirt and no tie, headed around the world with his camera and very carefully took pictures. He took pictures of the pyramids. He took pictures of the Holy Land, the place where perhaps Jesus was born, the place where perhaps Jesus died. He took pictures of, of hungry people and suffering people. And when he came back, he went from church to church with a magic device called a magic lantern, which could show these cumbersome slides on a screen with a light. And people who were worried about whether they should have Sunday school picnics or Sunday school or chicken and noodle dinners, that was one of the other controversies, suddenly saw the pyramids, saw camels, saw the place where Jesus might have been born and the place where he might have been crucified, saw hungry people, and suddenly the question of whether they should have missionaries or not, was, which was another controversy, because if you sent out missionaries, they might come back not caring about Sunday school picnics or minister training or other things. Suddenly, it wasn't a question anymore. They realized they were hurting people out there, and they sent out their missionaries, and their missionaries realized that in very hot climates, you didn't want to wear those black coats and you didn't want to wear those prayer coverings, and you didn't care anymore about all the things that people were worried about back in the United States. You only worried about the fact there were people who had never heard about Jesus, and we needed to send people out there. And the other Christian groups were sending out missionaries too. And when they got there, they realized all the things that separated them back in the United States didn't matter either. There was just a lot of work to be done in the name of Jesus Christ. Open to us the gates of righteousness and pass through. Much like what was happening in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, you had a lot of religious experts who were getting the people all riled up about how do you keep the Sabbath? You weren't supposed to work, but the Bible doesn't say anything about what is work, what is work and what isn't. In Jesus' day, there were religious experts who had figured out you could walk 630 steps and no more on the Sabbath. And there were people very carefully counting and they didn't have a Fitbit like my wife has and other people here in this building no doubt have, trying to count the number of steps they made. They didn't have the ability to count, but what they did know is that people were losing their farms. What they did know was people were being kicked off the land what they did know is that shepherds were no longer watching their own sheep. They were hirelings watching the sheep of another. And that when the angels came a couple decades before to sing glory to God in the highest and peace to people upon the earth, it wasn't to shepherds who owned their own flock but to people who didn't have two coins to rub together to call their own. 
when Jesus entered Jerusalem and the people sang the words of Psalm 118, open to us the gates of righteousness, save us, save us, O Lord. One of the songs that was sung at Passover, they realized Jesus was here not to settle how many steps they could walk. Jesus was here not to decide if you could have Sunday school picnics or what sort of clothes you were supposed to wear or what sort of hair, head covering you were supposed to wear. There were people who were suffering and struggling. And Jesus was leading them through the gates of righteousness, through their suffering, through the cross, to resurrection and new life on a path that nobody had ever thought of before. Instead of avoiding suffering, we embrace it together because that's the only way we can get through it. Instead of pretending we weren't broken, that we weren't suffering from cancer, suffering from diabetes, suffering from emotional and mental illness, instead of pretending that everything was well, suddenly we were people who were opening the gates of righteousness and walking with Jesus together towards new life because we couldn't do it on our own anymore. Now we might think all those things that bothered the brethren in the 1880s or all those things that bothered the Judeans in the first century don't matter to us. But we struggle with the same issues. Will we choose and imagine purity, trying to purify our people and deciding who's good enough and who isn't? Or will we recognize that we're at our best when we're the church ministering to others as a broken people. Think about us here at Union Center. When are we at our best? Not when we're trying to figure out the culture wars. Not when we're huddled watching our news station or dressed properly, or not when we're deciding who's good and who isn't, but when we're the Galilean gang raising money all year so we can take a truckload of goods down to Kentucky. We're at our best when we're working hard to be the kids club, when we're serving a fish dinner or a chicken noodle dinner to our community, when we're supporting ministries at camp and making it possible for families that don't have enough money to send their kids to camp. We're at our best when we put together a play in December for the, you know, at Christmas time, we're at our best when we meet Wednesday nights to begin to put together vacation Bible school and then when we work together for a week to do vacation Bible school. We're at our best when we invite the people who are suffering from drug and alcohol addiction and recovering from domestic violence, such as the women of SPA or the other ministries or are supporting our community jail chaplaincy because there are people hurting. If we try to decide how many steps we can walk on the Sabbath, if we try to decide what clothes we should wear or which people qualify and which people obviously don't qualify, we're not very good. If we decide who's in and who's out, which is what our culture is doing, we fail. But if we're ready to walk with Jesus on the road to Calvary and beyond to glorious new life in Christ, to resurrection, then, then we got something. Then we are somebody. This commitment is no better symbolized than in our love feast. Jesus shocked his disciples because 
he was willing to wrap a towel around his waist and take on the aspect of a slave. Instead of saying, I am great and glorious, he said, I am willing to follow what God has called me to do and wash the feet of others. When we are willing to break bread and share the cup, laugh at a meal around a table and be with each other as we are, then we are ready to walk through the gates that God has opened, the gates of righteousness, to once again celebrate our freedom from slavery, not only in Egypt, but the slavery of the sin that breaks us apart as a people, as a nation, and as a world. When those brethren missionaries went out because they saw the magic lantern slides, one of the places they went to was Nigeria. Our Nigerian brethren, who are faithfully Christian with a fervor that most of us don't know, are facing the forces of purity. Boko Haram means literally Western ways are evil or wrong. And what our Christian brethren in Nigeria are doing are not only trying to rebuild their own churches that have been burned, but they're also rebuilding mosques that have been burned and suffering with and ministering to people of all faiths who are sharing in a great struggle against the forces of those who would say, this is the right way to do everything, and if you don't do it our way, you're wrong. And they are succeeding. Their church is thriving because it is built upon love and service to others in spite of suffering. Let us continue to do what we do well, which is serve our community and to love each other and to bend a knee in service to each other. When we do that, we're good. When we try to figure out all the other questions, we fail. When we try to measure up to some standard that is artificial and non-biblical, we don't do as well. The religious leaders said, teacher, tell your disciples to maintain themselves. The word is, you know, to behave better. And he says, I say to you, if they were to be silent, the stones would cry aloud. If we stop being who we are and doing the things we do so very well, others would do them. But they have plenty that they need to do because we continue to embrace the ministries that serve each other, serve children, and serve the community. Let us be who we are. Let us follow Jesus. Let us demonstrate that the love of the cross is what triumphs in a world that has lost its way. Amen. <laughs>